Michael, I can't remember. It, it is over a year ago. I think it's what fourteen months ago you first contacted me. Um, I think that sounds about right. Yeah, somewhere around one year. And um, where did it all start? You know, we, we'll obviously get to what you've done and what you've achieved, but what what made you want to do what you've done? What well, I made mean, so good question. So. Um, it started uh, when my cousin had the idea to start a um, Star Wars themed Dungeons and Dragons campaign during the pandemic. And um, I'd never done D&D before, but I was excited and I thought it would be cool if um, my character was a droid because um, I like droids. Um, I don't know how you guys uh, are you guys into droids at all or a little bit. Yeah, OK, I, I think they're pretty cool. Um, and so I thought it would be cool if instead of uh, me narrating my droid's voice, um, if I had some kind of software that could actually uh, speak for the droid. So I set out to see what kind of um, existing solutions were out there. And everything that I found um, in toys, in video games, um, among droid builders, was um, basically kind of soundboard type stuff where you press a button and just a pre-recorded line gets played. And soundboards uh, are cool, they serve a purpose, and some of them are really nice, but they have two main issues, which are, first, they don't have any regard for variety, right? They're, you're playing pre-recorded lines, and there are only so many lines, and you're just hitting them over and over and over. The second issue they have is the big one, which is that they have no regard for context. So it doesn't matter what's happening around this droid, the soundboard is going to trigger the same sounds. And so that's, that's really unfortunate, because um, when sound and visuals work together, uh, magical, magical things happen. So imagine that you're at a conference and you guys are piloting a droid and someone is, uh, you know, a kid sees this droid and it looks like it came straight out of Star Wars. It's just an absolutely perfect, gorgeous build. Um, and the kid walks up to it and it wants to talk to it or it does something funny. How does the droid react? Well, if you just trigger a line from a soundboard, okay, you got sound, but did you get a connection, right? And so if you could have software that is triggering um, vocalizations that are emotionally specific and emotionally purposeful, then suddenly it takes the experience to this whole other level where not only does this droid look like it just rolled out of Star Wars, but it's talking to you and interacting with you in the same way that droids in Star Wars talk and interact and connect emotionally with people. That was the original pitch you gave me as well about 14 months ago, and I was engaged straight away. Admittedly, a lot of builders would be maybe happy with that, or they just have always gone with that because that's the only option they've had. Um, but obviously, because of your background as well, you've taken this to a whole new level because you've got a gaming background yourself anyway, haven't you, Michael? That's right. Yeah. So actually, I originally started, um, I studied um, audio technology at Stanford. And so I was in the music industry for a while, went from there to game development. So that's how these two kind of got tied together was um, my love of uh, all things sound and also my love of uh, these interactive um, experiences that unfold kind of uh, in real time and connect people uh, with uh, computers, machines, basically. Cool. cool. So did you, you achieve the Dungeons and Dragons thing, did you? Or did that just lead you straight into what you've achieved now? Um, it was so the Dungeons and Dragons was kind of a was a testing ground for the software as it came along, um, and it was kind of uh, it was kind of a perfect test because um, you know there are other people involved in the campaign who are playing off of this character, and so if a piece of software can be controlled to um, connect emotionally with other people in that way, then it can do the same thing um, at a convention, at a theme park, uh, anywhere. Uh, you can take that absolutely anywhere, and it's a really special thing. Okay, so where did this take you as far as R2's voice is concerned and so on? What, what did you find out from, from the early days of, of studying R2's voice? Um, so <laughs> what I found out was that R2 is a really difficult candidate for this sort of thing. Uh, actually, the most difficult candidate you could possibly have. And I have a, actually a clip from Ben Burt, who's the uh, sound designer behind R2, um, explaining um, some of the ideas that went into R2's voice. R2-D2 was probably the most difficult voice to work on because it was the most abstract. Here we had supposedly a machine 
that was going to talk, it was going to act, it was going to draw on our emotions, it was going to be in scenes with Alec Guinness and work as another actor, yet it was a machine. The initial experiments in coming up with R2's voice were all directed toward making a machine type of language, something that would come out of a computer, out of a robot. And although the voices were very interesting, I think, which I made, they all seemed to lack a sort of human quality. One day, uh, I just started making the sounds. I said, well, maybe R2 should kind of sound like this. And you'd imitate a little baby sound, Ooh, ah, you know, something like that. It's a sound you might have heard a little infant making when they were learning to talk. Communicating some kind of emotion, but not using well-formed English words. So I learned to combine my voice with electronic sounds, which I would play on the keyboard, the synthesizer. And in combining the two, uh, I was able to get a sense of performance out of the, out of the character and to get some emotion, emotion into the, the, the sounds that R2 made, because you, you can put an inflection and intonation. That way, we would still might be able to have the character of a, of a machine, but get the personality and the emotion of a living organism. So personality and emotion being the key words there. And that speaks to um, why R2's voice has been so memorable, uh, so culturally impactful, um, is that real um, human character that comes through in those um, synthetic sounds. Um, if you ask someone to make um, a BB-8 sound, they'll give you a you know a nice little like a you know a perfectly lovely sound. But if you ask someone to give you an R2D2 sound, you will get um, a sound by sound uh, impression of an entire line verbatim from one of the films with accurate pitch and timing and timbre. That's how even casual fans. That's how deeply ingrained and uh, how deeply beloved uh, R2's voice is. Um, and that's also the reason he's a really, really challenging target for a piece of software like this, is that people know what R2 is supposed to sound like, right? So if it doesn't sound exactly like R2, anyone can latch onto that and it's not gonna work. Yeah, because that's something I flagged very early on, was the uncanny alley. So the facts that the, the sounds that we trigger, you know, we've all got the same sounds. We all know it's an R2 sound. As soon as we play something different that's not on our sound bank, most regular droid operators would probably say, that's not right, that's not an R2 sound. So I was very concerned quite early on what you were going to replicate and what you were going to achieve. Yeah, Sam, is that something, uh, have you found that as well? Listen, I'm just like blown away by your production value. You know, I didn't realize I didn't realize you were going to be, you know, I thought we were just going to meet this guy and he's made this app and it's, you know, all that. And then all of a sudden you've got sound clips, you've got video. Um, the bit that's really confused me is why did you what made you think, you know what, I need to reach out to Lee Towsey to work on this. How did that come about? That is a great question. So um, that came about because, so I already knew of Lee because, well, A, because he's famous, and B, because, well, I've never <laughs> built droids. Um, I just, I love, uh, you know, I love making things, right? Uh, I don't only work in the audio space, so I've always followed droid building culture. And so as I was getting into this, I was thinking, this kind of software, so I wanted it for Dungeons and Dragons, I wanted it for fun, but I was thinking this could be of real use to droid builders. And so I just wanted to, before I went and invested, um, you know, whatever uh, ridiculous amount of, uh, of love and energy and time into this, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't crazy and that this was actually something that would mean something to people. And so I, I reached out to Lee and I've got to say, Lee got right back to me and just the, the enthusiasm and, and curiosity, Lee, that, um, that you shared in thinking about this and talking about it was so infectious. And that was really, that was really the thing that inspired me to just dive into this and make it happen. That's cool. Yeah. That's, really cool. That's good. So, so where did it, where did it go from there then? So I think the sounds, you, you broke the audio files down. Is that right? That's right. So um, I started with um, this collection of sound files that have been circulating in the Droid community for a while. We don't know quite where they came from, but they're pretty high quality. So I, I think they came from some kind of official source at some point. And so um, they are just long recordings. They're just lines from the films, basically. And so here's what um, those looked like uh, initially. So 
the before is just the the sound files lined up and the after is how is what they looked like after I jumped in and started breaking them down into smaller pieces so that we could work with them at a finer level. So um, those little blocks of color are organized by category. Um, the categories are basically different types of sounds, so tones, which are beeps, um, squeals, screams, whistles, a bunch of different categories. Um, and so first I broke the sounds into those, and those are what I called um, words. They were, those were effectively words in R2's speech. Um, from the words, I broke things down further and went in and kind of divided those words up at every conceivable breaking point within the words, and those became what I was calling syllables. Um, so those are uh, the finest unit that we have to work with, basically. And um, along the way, um, I had to do a little bit of cleanup on some of these sound files because some of them were kind of noisy, kind of distorted, um, had some kind of some reverb. They didn't sound like they were uh, really clean. And so here, for an example, uh, is one of the original noisier ones. So you can hear there's a lot of hiss, there's some distortion on some of the louder noises. And what I do is I plop that into what's called a spectrograph editor, and that brings up the sound. It becomes like a visual interpretation of the sound. And I've seen this in the, the Matrix. Axis... I've seen this in the Matrix. Come on, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely tapped into, into Neo to, to get this done. <laughs> Um, so the x-axis here is um, the sound over time. So it's something that's going bump, 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 bump. And the y-axis is the frequency. So the stuff down low is the deeper, bassier stuff, and the stuff up high is the higher pitch stuff. And so what you can do with a spectrograph editor is you can edit the sound file just like you would edit an image in Photoshop. You can go in and isolate pieces of it, kind of clean it up, tidy it. You can restore um, missing data um, that's been uh, clipped by distortion. And so by doing this, I was able to create um, a larger collection of just the purest possible syllable recordings that can be mixed and matched and swapped. Because if you had one syllable that sounds like you stuck a microphone on the swamps of Degova and you put that next to a syllable that looks like it came off uh, the soundboard from the recording studio, it's not going to be fluid speech, right? So each the sounds need to have a, a consistent quality across them. So that's where that ended up. And so, for example, here are the all of the words from the category that I called Rios, um, kind of like worry machine sounds. <laughs> Uh, those are the Rios. Uh, like I said, there are 16 different categories, some longer, some shorter. And um, here is another sort of uh, another technique I use to create finer building blocks. So R2 has one electrocution sound effect that's used in all the films. Here's what it sounds like. It's a perfectly cool sound. Um, in the films, it's okay that there's only one of these sounds because um, it appears um, it only appears you know once every couple hours, right? It's like once per film. But for our purposes, we want to be able to play that sound repeatedly. And so, in order to break that down and be able to build new varied versions of it, we again turn to our trusty tool, the spectrograph editor. And on top here, you see what that sound looks like just when you plop it in the green one. And then on the bottom, you see what it looks like after I've extracted all of the different individual pieces of that sound. And each little grouping of color is a different um, piece of sound that I've extracted. So for example, that blue line that you see at the very bottom, that's the lower moan. That sounds like this. And then across the top, you have these little colored ladder looking things. Those are the tones. And then you have the swirls that are these little triplet kind of upward curving things kind of in between the two. And so we have all these pieces and um, what do we do with them? Well, so what we want to do obviously is piece them together to create new speech. And as it turns out, there's actually precedent for this. As I started going through and analyzing R2's lines across the nine Skywalker Saga films, um, I found that of uh, all of these sounds that R2 makes, nearly all of them 
come from the original trilogy. And of those, nearly all of those come from just episode four. So 90% of all of the sounds that R2 has ever uttered across all media over 50 years come from these same recording sessions for episode four. And the way that they made these new vocalizations was, again, not by jumping into the studio and recording new sounds because you don't mess with perfection, right? Uh, they made these new vocalizations by doing what I'm doing here, taking individual pieces of these original recordings and rearranging them, changing their timing, processing them with some pitch shifting to create new variations, new speech for R2 from this original source material. And so that's what I set out to do. So how many sounds did you start off with, Michael, that you extracted from the film? How many, how many sounds did you have? Um, so I ended up with... Um, about 350 unique syllables. And so those 350 syllables are the ones that I was saying basically form the basis of um, more or less all of R2's speech, 90% of R2's speech uh, across all of the films. Gotcha. And not just from what the, the files that you found that available to the, the club members, but am I right in saying you did go through every single film as well and checked that you had all the R2 sounds? That's right. Um, well, I kind of had to do it because once we have all these individual pieces, the question then becomes, how do you how how do you rearrange them? Right. There's so many variables that can go into rearranging these sound files into speech. And we have to go about it because, as Ben described, these these sounds and the speech is so organic, so so living. Um, you can't just take all these sounds and just randomly, you know, stick them one after another. You have to pay attention to every single variable and make sure you get it right. And you have to basically reverse engineer the process that the designers used to create these different variations. Because if you don't, uh, like I said, uh, if you don't get it exactly right, uh, people are gonna notice it's not gonna sound like R2. So if you want to do that right, the only way to do it is to go through all of the films. And what I did was I identified every single syllable uttered in the nine Skywalker saga films um, and tied it back to these original um, couple hundred source syllables. So for example, here is R2's very first line from episode four. Did you hear that? They shut down the main reactor. So ba, ba, da, da, ba, that's the line that we are trying to identify. So we know that first sound, the ba, is a tone. That's the, it's the tone category. So we have to dive into our tones and try to figure out which one it is. And here's what that involves. Here are the tones that you need to wade through to try to find a match. So no big deal, right? We know it's just one of those. Um, so <laughs> it turns out to be a match for uh, what I labeled tone I. So cool, we got our first tone. Now we move on to the next syllable and on and on and on. And uh, when all is said and done, there were about 2,000 syllables uttered in the films. So 2,000 identifications that looked like this. So going back to that line, it turns out to be tone I. Greet C, tone E, and here's what that sounds like recreated from these source files. So there it is, right? That's our line. Yeah. What does that tell us? What do we learn from that? We learned that tone I can initiate a sentence. We learned that greet C can come after tone I. We learn how much of a gap there can be between tone I and greet C, and so on and so on. So every single line we identify gives us all of these new data points that we can extrapolate from to create this algorithm that can do the same thing that the designers are doing when they're sitting there and you know dragging different pieces of the existing sound files to create a new vocalization. The software can do that automatically in real time. So here's another example of um, another line. Put that down. No, we. Hey! So that's a Rio. It's a Rao. Um, here is what sounds like another Rio. Where do you think you're going? It's much higher pitched, right? Turns out those are actually the same sound file. And the way. So 
because I have some background in audio, I have some experience kind of working on this sort of post-processing. So I can identify some of the um, the signature um, kind of characteristics of a, a pitch shift, pitch shifted sound like that. And um, in the 70s, when they were doing this, they didn't have um, modern technology to do these, you know, they weren't just twiddling a knob and suddenly the pitch rises or falls. They were most likely just playing back the tape at a faster speed, which is the same effect you'd get if you had a little tape deck and held fast forward, right? It's the chipmunk effect. And so that means two things. When they did their pitch shifting, the pitch would increase and also the clip would play back faster, right? It's happening faster, so it becomes shorter. So if you can look for those two hallmarks of a pitch shifted clip, you can find uh, these examples of um, this sort of post-processing effects that they use. And so here is uh, Rio H, which is the Rio sound effect, uh, lower pitched. And here it is higher pitched as appeared in episode four. So again, that's the exact same sound just pitch shifted and time compressed. So what do we learn from this? We learned that here's another type of variation that our software is allowed to do that will still adhere to Canon and still create the impression of the true R2. will still sound like it could have come straight from one of the films. We can take real age and we can play it back at 100% speed, or we can play back at 160% speed with higher pitch. And we can do anything in between there and if there's another Rio that has very, very similar quality to Rio H, we can extrapolate that we can probably do the same uh, set of processes to that Rio. So again, just it, it turns into this complex set of incredible rules of, you know, billions and billions and billions of logical steps of um, what sounds can start a sentence, what can come next, how long do you have in between them, is that gap measured from the end of the previous one or the start of the previous one, um, what does that mean for the one that come next, and how does how do those set of choices affect every other individual choice made along the way. Michael, so can I ask a question? Yes, please do. Can you, can you now speak droid? Um, in my mind, so I unfortunately I dream in droid now. Um, <laughs> yeah, in, all, in, all, in all seriousness, though, you may you know you know when when you know when uh, we do we do an event or something like that, and, and a question is asked, "Hey RT, what do you think about this?" You know, as an operator, you kind of try and best guess the right particular sound that you're going to try and make. And sometimes that might be with a controller, or it might be with a soundboard, as you said. Um, and sometimes it's just complete guesswork. Hang on a minute. What does this combo do? You press all the buttons and you never know quite what's going to happen. You must get, you know, obviously, obviously you're obsessive with, with this particular thing. And, and that's great. That's a really, really great quality. But, you know, you must have got to a point where you were like, I know, you know, I know what he's saying. When 3PO is asking a question or saying something, you must now watch the films in a slightly different way, thinking, yeah, I actually know what he's saying. Not just like a, a beep or a whiz or a pop or a bang or whatever. You know, you, you must get that. You know, you, you're like the insider. It's really, really odd, but amazing at the same time. So cool. So cool. Um, um, sure. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. You're exactly right. Um, and... Um, it's it's to the point where well so that was kind of being able to understand basically what he's saying is an important component of this right so the logical framework the algorithm that i've described putting together so far is what lets you make sounds that sound like they're from r2 right but that's only half of the goal of the project uh, we want infinite variety and that sounds true to r2 which is what we get here but we also want vocalizations that are emotionally appropriate, right? That are context specific. And so that's where that starts to come into play. That's kind of like the second set of rules that we need to determine in order to decide um, not just how can R2 talk, but um, how can he talk to convey a specific idea? You know, not necessarily a specific sentence because that's not how the designers were thinking, uh, cool. even though there are, you know, translations that can be applied to some of R2's lines, but they were working, as Ben Burt said, in, in emotion, right? So that's the key, is being able to assemble these vocalizations in a way that's emotionally appropriate. So how do we make that happen? Well, the first question we need to ask is, how do we, how do we categorize, how do we characterize R2's emotions in the films? How can we um, codify those, assign values to them. So what I ended up going with 
was um, there were there are different uh, there are different emotional theories, and I went with um, uh, Paul Ekman's uh, six core emotions. I went with a broken down four emotion version of that theory. So the four emotions that I went with for RT were happiness, sadness, anger, and fear, and I found that those four core emotions can um, encompass basically all of the emotional range that R2 displays in the films. Um, because when you start mixing those emotions, for example, um, when R2 is happy and angry, those are times when he's like sassing C-3PO, right? When he's ribbing him, he's happy, he's annoyed with him, he's angry. Um, you can have nostalgia. Um, you can have R2 being uh, happy and being sad at the same time, right? And you can have him excited when he's got some happiness, but he's also afraid. So with those four core emotions, you can assign values to all of the lines from the films. And that's what I went through and did. So we end up with this spreadsheet where for every line in the films, um, those four emotions are assigned a value. And when I was assigning these, I tried to make a point of only using the context within the scenes. So I don't want to say that because R2 sounds seem a little bit happy that he must be happy because that's reverse engineering what we're trying to do, right? We want to know what's happening in the scene. Um, what does his body language look like? How are other characters reacting to what R2 said? And so um, I went through and a lot of the scenes, the context is pretty clear. There's no ambiguity around uh, what R2 is trying to convey. But there were also a lot of scenes where I have an assumption about how R2 is feeling in that scene because I've watched the movies a million times um, and I think I know who R2 is. But sometimes it turned out that the assumptions that I had about the scene didn't necessarily hold up to the vocalizations that the designers had used for those scenes. So for example, let's look again at the uh, R2's first line from the opening sequence of episode four. Did you hear that? They shut down the main so during that whole scene on the Tantiv, um, I kind of felt like R2 is being kind of happy-go-lucky. He's kind of dismissing C-3PO a little bit, right? He's R R2's a tough guy. He's not really phased. He's just kind of going through, doing his duty, right? Um, and I think a lot of people kind of got that impression. I don't know. Is that is that how you guys felt about that, the whole Tantiv battle? Yeah. But having listened to it now, I'm already kind of thinking differently now after what you've explained. So... I'm glad you're thinking differently um, <laughs> because that segues very nicely into, uh, so the other thing we can do, we have this database of where all of these sounds appeared in the films. We can cross reference that line, those combinations of syllables with other instances in the nine films where those same syllables appeared. And so here are some other times that R2 gave that ba -ba -da -da -ba line. Yes, R2. So, kind of scary moments, right? Mm. Yeah. And it's kind of a worry, isn't it? It's sort of a worried feel to it now. It's it's very worried. Um, and so I went through for that whole scene because again, uh, there are no, they never explicitly say how R2 is feeling during that opening. And line after line after line, as I cross referenced, I found matches with uh, really nervous moments in other films. Um, and so here is the very last line from that scene. Are you sure this thing is safe? Oh. So. What does R2 think? Does he think the escape pod is safe? I always assumed he's like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Right? That's how we I usually think of R2. <laughs> this is dangerous, dude. You could be changing people's childhoods right now. <laughs> it is dangerous, but it's a good kind of dangerous. So here are other instances of that line. You're lucky you don't taste very good. Anything broken? Hello there. Come here, my little friend. Don't be afraid. Afraid. Mm. Right? So, does yes. Archie think the escape pod is safe? It does not seem like he does. Yeah. That's interesting. 
That really is it. And you've done that with all the sound bites. You've translated them into English, if you like, haven't you, Michael? Uh, that's right. So I took uh, for some of them, there's a, a verbatim translation. And I for the other ones that don't using all these contextual cues, I took my best guess. Um, there were some scenes that just were ambiguous, and there was no match. So I, you know, I didn't make any assumptions for those. So those aren't part of the database. But yes, that's basically right. And um, as I went through, and you know, once it was all finished, I went back and looked. And it turns out that R2 spends 75% of his time with some level of fear, which is crazy to me, right? R2 is almost always afraid. And I was trying to think about why we have this misconception about how kind of R2's kind of core character. And I think it maybe comes back to the fact that um, in the early films that were sort of our formative experiences with R2, um, the puppeteering and the control of R2 was because of technological limitations. It was kind of stilted, right? He was kind of kind of stiff. And I think that that steadiness may have conveyed um, a sort of um, kind of emotional steadiness that wasn't necessarily uh, intended by the filmmakers. Um, and it really speaks to in the newer films, you don't, there's a lot more emotion conveyed because we have talented operators uh, out there who are making sure that uh, not only is the, still the audio side, <laughs> 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 but he, he's stiff, but he's less stiff, right? And it's so his his movements are are more in sync with um, with the sound side, right? They're kind of he's he's conveying a more consistent picture, and so um, I just thought that was totally wild that R two is actually I mean he's afraid as often as C three PO is, and so the time the one line that to me. Um, after having gone through all of these, summed up what I found to be the true nature of R2's character best was a line from episode six as they're preparing for the assault on the Death Star. And before I play it, um, I'm going to play the other instances of the same line, which is, or the same word, which is um, bird song HC9. So here are the other instances of variations on that bird hang song. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Is this like a spoiler alert at this point? <laughs> A spoiler alert point in what sense? As in, you know, is this going to change my conception on everything that R2 stands for? Because people um, need to be warned about this. You're, you're, um, <laughs> you're demystifying stuff that we thought was one way, and now we're finding out it's another. If I haven't changed your mind already, I don't think this is going <laughs> to this is going to do the trick. Okay, I'm going to brace myself. Go for it. Go for okay. it. Okay. So again, here is uh, here is Birdsong HC9 uh, as it appears in a bunch of films. <laughs> So they're variations, but they're all the same word. They're all the same bird song. Um, here is R2 preparing for the second Death Star battle. Chewy. Exciting is hardly the word I would choose. So he's nervous, right? We know he uses this vocalization when he's nervous, but what he says is something like, this sure is exciting. Mm. And to me, that's R2 in a nutshell, right? He's not this blindly confident, um, one-dimensional kind of happy-go-lucky guy like I always assumed he was. He's actually, um, he's you know, he's not he's not C3PO's one-dimensional steady counterpoint. He's really C3PO's gutsy, forward-looking counterpoint, right? They're both scared a lot of the time. But R2-D2 tackles that fear um, with, uh, with courage, with bravery. He's gutsy. And so that, I think, is R2-D2 in a nutshell. He's, it's, not, it's not fear. It's, it's excitement. That's how he processes fear. Right. That's, that's interesting. I've got to say, Michael, I tried to get Ben Burt involved, but sadly, I just couldn't get hold of him. I don't know where he is at the moment. I know he's still working for Lucasfilm. But it would be nice to have him back this up. Um, of course, this is your theory, and I, I see where you're coming from, and I can only agree with you, you know, from what we're seeing here. What do you think, Sam? Well, you know, one thing that really kind of um, quizzes me a little bit is that Brian Herring, when he's operating BB-8, along with Matt and Josh and everybody, he does the beeps and whistles and the woos and things. Guess who does the R2-D2 beeps and whistles? Well, it's not Lee, that's for sure, because Lee doesn't like doing it. No. And he's, uh, he's very well known for not beeping and whistling. <laughs> so it is very much down to 
you know, you're taking, you know, when you're doing the stuff on set, you're taking direction from the director, obviously. Um, and you've got to read that and you've got to understand that. Do you think, you know, knowing what, what we've discovered tonight with Michael here, do you think that maybe you would have played it any differently trying to consider his emotions at that point, Lee? I don't think I would, because like you say, I get, I get directorship from JJ or whoever the director is. So you put faith in them knowing what they want to achieve and they want to get from R2, you just want to deliver. Mm. And then obviously, as we've always said on set as well, it's what's done in post-production with the audio that then just finishes it off nicely. And now to know in theory what he's actually saying, well, it's fascinating. It's, it's brilliant. It certainly is, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I don't know what's quite, you know, you know, when, you know when we went to go and see The Last Jedi, and you were like, what did you think? And I was like, I don't really know what to say. I'm at that point <laughs> with this right now. Like, oh man, I'm going to have to read uh, the films. I think the thing this. is, what Michael's done here is he's, you know, we're fanatical about our R2 builds and Astromex in general and droid building. And the sound is the sound is the sound to us. We're not, you know, audio geeks where we would spend this kind of obscene amount of time on the audio files like Michael has. And like he's the he's to, to me he's the messiah of R two sounds now, um, as as like the builders are you know to Lucasfilm that are replicating all these wonderful droids. What Michael's done with these sounds is just something that we'd never even considered doing because nice. we're nice. not knowledgeable enough. And I didn't even know you could do this, you know, with nice. sound. Even well, Michael, Michael, tell me, tell me, what does your average day look like? Let me guess. Get up, brush your teeth, have some breakfast and sit there and code beeps is that you know, how 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 has this how has this come to this fruition you know you, you've obviously put a hell of a do you know have you quantified how much time you've actually put into this as in hours? no no because it's got to be a lot right it's got to be a hell of a lot of time it's a lot yeah <laughs> it's probably very it doesn't sam because you know i'm sure for i know some of the stuff that michael has worked on in you know as work wise and if you costed the time you spent on this i we wouldn't be able to afford it <laughs> wow. have you got any other examples michael uh i do actually um so here is one uh that i thought was kind of funny that uh sheds a little it's you know it's it's nothing transformative but it's a funny little insight into r2's character so here is um a sequence that r2 uses to vocalize um extreme happiness <laughs> oh, hello. Find Master Luke Howe. I don't think I'd seen R2 thrusting like that before, actually. <laughs> That's something I did miss. I think I did definitely miss. Well, I'm going to say, if you're going to use those sound files as, one, as part of your theory, Michael, I can't argue with you. He looks very excited. <laughs> 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 so good. Okay, so we don't have any debate on that. At least uh, we can all agree that's that's a, a, an elative uh, sequence. So um, almost all the times in the films that R2 uses that vocalization is extreme happiness. But there are two instances where that's not really the case. Here's one of them. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Oh, he says it's nothing, sir. Merely a malfunction. Old data. Pay it no mind. So that's a little bit weird, right? Luke's been prying at R2. He's activated the secret message that R2 doesn't want Luke to see. Why is R2 suddenly so elated? Um, well, what he's saying is, oh, don't worry about that. That's nothing, right? That's, that's just old data. That's R2 putting on a faux chipper attitude to try to manipulate Luke into thinking there's nothing to worry about. And R2 is, it looks like possibly not a great actor because he's completely overplaying it, right? Okay. So yeah. here's one other example of that same line again being used in a non, a kind of unusual circumstance. We're not going to regroup with the others. We're going to the Dagobah system. Yes, R2. That's all right. I'd like to keep it on manual control for a while. 
So, dun, 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 dun. and he's saying, he's asking to turn on autopilot. Basically, he wants to take over and control the ship. So why, as he's freaking out about this approach to Dagobah, is he suddenly in such good spirits? Well, it's the same thing again, right? He's trying to convince Luke to let him get them the heck out of there. He's saying, hey, so is it cool if I just go ahead and turn on autopilot? And Luke just laughs because by this point, Luke is why star to his waves, right? So he's not following for this one. So that's an example of how these, these vocalizations that the sound designers chose were so deliberate, right? They really are conveying very specific ideas and revealing so much about R2's character. Um, one last one that I thought was funny. No, I don't think he likes you at all. So that's R2's line for, do you think he likes me? That line appears one other time in the films, and it's here. So what's going on here? Like They're on Dagobah. It? Hmm? It's like he's dejected. It's like he's sort of almost like, oh, like his feelings are hurt almost. It's like his feelings are hurt, right? Luke told him to wait at the base camp while Luke goes off and talks to Yoda. R2 has disobeyed orders and snuck after them, and he's spying on them. And he's seeing Luke becoming fast friends with Yoda. And it seems like maybe he's a little bit jealous, right? What's he saying? He's saying, does he still like me? He's talking to himself, right? He's wondering if he has been bitched for a new small friend in Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's in... Uh... Man, I think you could probably like teach this sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's quite like almost, you know, when you're in like an English class in school and they say, okay, so what does that mean? What, what, do, you, what do you think you meant by that? Why, why did Romeo do this? And you're like, oh my God, yeah, it's this whole other thing that maybe they were thinking about, maybe they weren't. It's all down to interpretation, I guess. But wow. So how? What, what's next then? Where does this all lead to? Where does this all lead? So we have this uh, database of emotions and how do we choose, how do we decide how to assemble these clips in a way that um, conveys emotion? Well, I turn this database into what's basically an AI for R2's emotions. This AI can go through and it can do two things. First, it can um, inform the kind of sequential logic to say, if we want R2 to be, um, R2's happy right now and something scary just happened. So we want him to voice fear, but also fear that's tinged with happiness. We can apply this database to kind of turn basically all of these individual syllables, these granular syllables into a gradient of choice. Um, so it could affect anything from the pitch of the syllables to which syllables are chosen to how quickly or slowly they're, they're vocalized. Um, so suddenly the things that we're voicing aren't just lines that sound like they're from the films, they're lines that sound like they're from the films and are conveying a very specific emotion, a very specific concept. And the second thing that this AI does is it decides, so we want to keep track of how R2 is feeling, right? Uh, because we want to know if he's been scared, we want that to influence his vocalization. So the AI is keeping tabs on R2's, on these four emotions, right? Is he happy? Is he sad? Is he angry? Is he scared? And when there is a stimulus, whether that stimulus is in from a user operating um, the software saying, you know, something, something good just happened, something scary just happened, or whether it's an autonomous droid that someone has built that has sensors that are kind of processing it and making those decisions, the AI can say, so for example, maybe R2 is very happy and very mad because he's been sassing C-3PO and something frightening happens. Well, a normal person in that situation, uh, their happiness would decrease, drop probably basically to zero. Um, their anger would decrease a little bit, right? It would get numbed by the fear. But because we have this database that says exactly how R2 has felt in every one of these scenes and tells us how his emotions have changed, we can use that logic to tell our AI, well, when R2 is happy and angry and something scary happens, his happiness doesn't drop to zero. Maybe it settles at kind of moderate happiness because he's kind of a happy guy. And his anger isn't gonna just get numbed a little, it's probably gonna drop pretty low because he's generally not an angry guy. He doesn't spend a lot of time angry. And of course, obviously his fear is gonna shoot up because something scary just happened. So suddenly we have this like very sentient, 
um, a power AI powered piece of software that really is thinking and behaving like the character R2D2 from the films. Okay. So how does that manifest then? What, 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 how do we, how do we, how do we tap into that software? How do we tap into it? So, um, drum roll, please. Available now on a platform near you is the uh, R2D2 vocalizer app from Human Cyborg Relations, the project name. Oh, wow. And this app is basically the portal that lets a user interact with this software. Um, it's a series of eight buttons, um, four buttons for extreme versions of those four emotions, four buttons for more mild versions. And you as the operator um, say, um, did something good just happen? Is there a good stimulus? You hit the happy button. Did something scary happen? You press the, the fear button. Did something a little bit sad happen? You know, did a, did a kid, did a little kid just trip on the convention floor? You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a sad vocalization. So it's this very simple way for you who already has your hands full, um, operating this R2D2, um, physically operating his movement. It's a way for you to then have an easy control. Um, it's like a, a kind of simple funnel where simple inputs from you guys turn into, because the software does so much heavy lifting, turn into complex but emotionally specific vocalizations. And so I put together um, a little demo of uh, how the app looks. I can show you guys if you want to see it in action. Yeah, let's do it. So, Go for it. so here it is. Um, you can see the buttons uh, on the uh, right two thirds that used to trigger the emotions and you have the extreme version on top and you have the less extreme version on bottom. And I wanted this to look like a panel, a Star Wars panel, right? That kind of retro grimy incandescent aesthetic. Um, I wanted it to be this like kind of tactile immersive experience. And so it doesn't, it's not just a two dimensional image app, it's actually a three dimensional scene. And so as you manipulate it, as you kind of move your phone, move your device, the panel shifts focus a little bit, the lighting glares off it. So it feels like you're using this thing. So now um, here are some of the vocalizations in action. You have the electrocution button. <laughs> and everyone is different. And you have uh, the Muse button that's sort of an autoplay that plays sounds periodically, but they're not just sounds chosen at random. They're sounds from scenes when R2 is kind of muttering to himself or doing his own thing because he's not supposed to be reacting to something specific. He's supposed to just be um, kind of just chattering a little bit. But again, chattering in a way you can see with the lamps, he's very scared. So he's chattering with kind of a, a scared, uh, fearful inflection as he does that. And um, those emotional settings apply to all of the vocalizations. So you have that, you have a memory bank where you can store, uh, if there's a vocalization you like and want to replay it, you can store it. You have all these different settings where you can control it. And so what you can do with this is just create new vocalizations that the world has never heard before. So again, here is um, Birdsong B. Um, this appears in the films a bunch of times. It's very iconic. Here is a variation on Birdsong B uh, from episode five. Same word with the syllables rearranged. And now here is the human cyborg relations software generating new uh, vocalizations of that same bird song that have never been heard before. So they all have the same cadence as Birdsong B, but they're all totally unique. And so the software can do that just with that one word, that Birdsong B. When you start bringing in all of the different syllables from all the different words and this whole pool of logic, you can just imagine the sort of variety um, and sort of um, you know emotional specificity that it can imbue in these vocalizations. Here's the same thing. Here's the scream from uh, the original film. There's only one scream in all of Star Wars. Uh, it gets reused. Um, here it is in episode three, and they kind of stretched it out a little bit and changed the way the pitch ramps over it. 
And here is human cyborg relations taking all the information it's learned about these variations and creating, again, brand new screams in real time. <laughs> I can see I can see R2 doing the old uh, shake at this point. <laughs> wow. How clever so, I mean, is that, un Sam? Un unmistakably it's R2, isn't it? I mean yeah. you can't you can't get away from that. I mean it's it wow, that's so hang on, so you've got this app, okay? You've downloaded it from wherever you've downloaded it from. How does it how do you get that from your phone to your uh droid I'm, I'm guessing bluetooth or something like that yes so uh bluetooth is a good way to do it um there is um the new bluetooth le standard that's rolling out that is super low latency um is has much more reliable connection uh, it's made to work in public spaces so it'll give you a lot better performance than you might get um from uh, older Bluetooth standards at kind of busier scenes. Um, so there's that, but also I really want to explore porting this over to a bare metal platform that can be embedded on the droid itself, right? Because if you can offload all of the logic onto the droid and instead um, basically be triggering, you know, because it's just, it's 10 buttons, right? 10 buttons control this entire thing. If you can then have um, an RC controlled panel with those 10 buttons, you can use those and on the droid itself, all the processing is going to happen. You don't have to be streaming audio or worry about any of those issues. So for something like that, if there's anyone out there who has experience working with, for example, the Teensy audio platform, uh, I would love to talk to you. What's that, um, that's what's that unit because, called? <laughs> because we're, um, we're trying this Kyber system as well now, Michael, which has uh, recently been sent to Sam and myself. And it's possibly something we, we hope to include in the same show, um, which is a button device that goes into a standard RC unit and it triggers sounds basically. And it just uses one channel off of your transmitter, but it then just uses small segments of that channel, different frequencies for different sounds. So it, that may work as well. That could be an option, but certainly I'm sure we can put you in touch with those people. Um, mm. It means more work for you, however. <laughs> but, you know, it's what you've done is phenomenal. You That's know, I'm idea. just blown away. And the other thing, because people are still going to be watching this and thinking, yeah, but how much? How much is this costing them, Michael? Uh, it costs them zero. The app is free. There you go. Wow. wow. So just, just, I can't say it any other way, really, but the kindness of your heart, you, I've suggested you earn money from it. You know, even if it was a pound for the app to download, but you you flatly refused and you've kindly said you're happy to offer this to the club because you love what the Joy Builders do and make this available through the app stores and um, download on their mobile devices to, to use. Wow. So what yeah. happens tomorrow? You go back to Dungeons and Dragons or <laughs> what happens? Well, I, I do run a business, uh, you know, in my spare time in my day to day. So... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's insanity. I mean, obviously, we've seen um, a variety of different apps and people having ideas and things, but nothing quite like that. I mean, that that's some hardcore dedication to the cause, uh, and I have to commend you for that because that is uh, that that is a hell of a lot of time. And uh, you know, now I think when I go and if and when I watch the uh, the films again, um, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be thinking other things and I'm guessing my wife's going to be like, what are you laughing at? Or what are you, why are you so concerned? Well, I wasn't <laughs> thinking what I was thinking, was he? You know, it's, uh, oh man, alive. That is, um, yeah, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a game changer. That it is a bit of a game changer. It's wow. amazing. It's amazing. Thank, thank you, Michael. And we're honored to be able to include this in the show and, and to launch such a great product as well. You know, it's, it's such an honor. It's, it's so good of you. This is a nice fitting end to the last 14 months or so that we've spent on Zoom chats between the two of us. And um, I'm so grateful for what you've done. I think there's one other thing to finish off with, though, I believe, which is something else that took me by surprise. You, you found something to do with another sound from another droid, I believe. 
Uh, a little bit, yeah. I decided that um, going with the most complex droids um, was, you know, a fun way to start, but then maybe for the second one, I should go for one of the least complex droids. So you might recognize this sound. <laughs> So obviously that's the the gonk droid. Uh, that's his line as it appears in the films. Yep. And um, no one has really isolated a great quality version of that line. Uh, some video games have had just the gonk, but um, nothing has had, there's been no source for just the entire pure line. So for that, I again, turn back to um, our trusty Spectrograph editor. And um, after a lot of massaging, here's what I ended up with. So there it is. Here it is again with all the noise. So until someone from Disney uh, kindly uh, mails us a tape of the original soundboard recording, I think this is about as good as we're going to get. And uh, one thing I thought was very intriguing about this was when I listened to this isolated, uh, I'm not necessarily hearing gonk. I'm hearing something else. And maybe I won't say what I'm hearing and maybe we'll let people kind of uh, form their own interpretations and see. Oh my God, this is, this is like one of those ghost programs where they hear the noise for the first time and then everyone's <laughs> freaking out about it. What is going on? Oh my God. Oh dear. That is, uh, I was trying to listen really attentively for what that was saying. I couldn't quite work out what... Uh, the second line was there, but um, so yes. I'll send you I'll send you the uh, you know the the clean file because this is just over Zoom, right? So when you hear the raw thing, um, yes. uh, I'm curious to hear what you think. And so okay. we have this source file, and it's these you know these basically kind of three words I would say. And so uh, I think it's going to be I think you'll be pretty surprised to see how much variety human cyborg relations is able to extract from those couple sounds. So I'm excited to, uh, to unveil it that It better one. not be your surname or something, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be really annoyed if it goes gong, no. gong, my name's Lee Towsy, because that's kind of what it sounded a bit like, <laughs> if I'm honest. I can assure you it's not that, because Michael and I have had this conversation already. Okay. So, I like See, the yeah, one you've done that, What you don't know is the um, one of the actors that, that plays one of the gonks she uh arty her name is and she goes around just saying gonk 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 all the time so i you know as and when i hear that i just think of her so it's you know really bizarre really really bizarre but incredible at the same time yeah thank absolutely. you well i think well, that's a fitting end for this interview this chat is fascinating amazing anything else to say sam i mate honestly that is i've got a newfound respect for, for uh for you being involved now um, after thrashing me on the uh, ALT racing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, well done. This is absolutely incredible. And what, what a fantastic thing you've done, you know, putting this app out there for, you know, droid builders to use. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. Thank you guys so much for chatting. Okay, mate. Take care. Take care. And I'll Bye see thanks. you soon. Thank you very much. And back to Lee and Sam in the studio.